Natasha Gewaltig. She's a C director at, of European Economics and Action Economics. Natasha, thank you so much for uh, joining us on the program. I just wanted to get to that breaking news actually we had just from the German finance ministry saying that the fourth quarter economic growth will be noticeably slower. Overall, it does seem that the picture in Europe is now getting worse because we're facing, if not slower growth, or certainly a recession in the periphery countries. How bad is it now? Or have we now entered a new phase of this crisis? Well, I think it, it shouldn't really be coming as a, as a big news that Q4, um, the economic growth in the fourth quarter, will be looking pretty weak. You know, the problem is, or the, the, the real question is how much... Uh, um, how much can we recover from that ne next year? And is there really going to be recession, so two quarters of negative growth? And that really depends at the moment on, on the political side and how much the debt crisis is affecting the real economy. I think that's what we are seeing now, you know, that the real, the real economy now is really impacted by and, it. And that's, of course, a problem because coupled with austerity measures, it's going to make everything a lot worse. But in terms of the breaking news, we're also saying that inflation will slow as a global economic growth ebbs. Does it mean that actually eventually the Germans, if they see, for example, a recession, will just be a lot more willing to let the ECB play this role of lender of last resort, because that is the only solution, as we see it, to actually get us out of the crisis without any Eurozone country defaulting. Well, at the moment, that is, it's not a decision Germany can take or the ECB can take. I mean, there is a limit on how much the ECB can do also from the treaty, so you would really have to find a way around that. I think um, even the ECB last week, as sort I of said, even quantitative easing that is extending the bond buying beyond what they are able to sterilize would already be a, a legal issue you know so it, 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 it is always presented as if Germany holds the key to them but it, that's not the case. But Detach, when there's a will there's a way so I imagine if they get the support um, of Germany then maybe the ECB can start looking at ways to change the treaties oh, and did, to go forward. Oh, but as, as Draghi said at the last press concert what makes you think that's actually going to help you know I don't think that really is the solution I mean that is what markets are pushing for totally agree with that I don't necessarily think that is the way forward. Natasha looking actually at a six-month chart in terms of what we're seeing with the stock 600 if we get that up for you you can see that uh, most of this year's losses came around the time of the US downgrade in July so we talk about the European debt crisis day in day out but actually should we focus more on the US debt ceiling because that's really the elephant in the room. Well, <clears throat> sorry, I think what has become clear is that uh, debt problems don't only occur in countries like Greece. I think that is generally a problem. If you sort of um, build on an, on an economic policy that is built on, on debt financing, you know, there comes a time where you have to pay it back. And that is now we are, you know, this is a problem all developed countries face. You know, it's not just Greece, it's not just Spain, France, UK, US, you know, across the board. Germany's... Uh, deficit level has, has risen, risen and I think within the Eurozone now we have hardly have anyone who is uh, below the 60% yep. debt limit that is, was originally but laid Natasha, down. In terms of an economist and really where you see the most risk is actually the US a rich, riskier situation than what we have here in Europe because well, from, we have less consumer. I mean in terms of worldwide we're still less important than the US. Well exactly I mean from that point of view obviously you know US is the big yes you say elephant in the room because uh, it is the biggest uh, economy if there is a real problem there, then it will drag everything down with it. There is no way um, other countries will be will not be impacted by it. You know, I think you can always think, okay, at least that's how we started. Okay, Greece is so small, it's not going to have an impact. Well, nobody will be able to say that with the U.S. And do you think this is a real risk today, or is it just politics in manoeuvring? You know, these two houses not getting along. At the end of the day, will they have a solution in place? I I would really hope so. You know, I mean. It, it, Everybody is, is losing so much confidence at the moment that the worst case scenarios are being put out all the time and I think that is one of the problems. I wouldn't say it's a, it's a central scenario but you know at the same time nothing is 100% certain you know and I think that is one of the biggest problem at the moment that everyone's focusing so much on the, on the negative side and in the end that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy in the end. Our Europe editor, David Tweed, is also with us. Now, David, do we have any further clarity on exactly what Rajoy plans to do from now onwards? No, that's what we're probably going to be getting either. It might even come as early as today, certainly this week, because he hasn't got a lot of time. He really does need to outline exactly how he's going to uh, achieve the, ch uh, the, the, the objectives that he's outlined. He wants to bring down that Spanish unemployment rate. 23% at the moment. So expect him to do something on the Spanish labour market. Secondly, he's promised further austerity, and that austerity is to bring the budget deficit for 2012 
down to 4.4 percent, down from 6.6 percent projected in 2011. That's quite a big task. And then thirdly, you can expect some more restructuring of the banks. Remember that these Spanish banks holding billions of uh, bad loans in terms of their real estate loan book. So that's really what he's going to be focusing on. Also, interestingly enough, last night he was talking about Spain also taking a bigger role in making its voice heard in the European Union. Hoy más que nunca. The Spanish voice needs to be heard and respected in Brussels and Frankfurt. We'll be the most loyal, but also the most demanding of partners. We'll stop being part of the problem and start being part of the solution. Now, he doesn't actually take over the reins of power until mid-December, after mid-December. So until then, he's, just, he's said that he's going to work with the, uh, with the Prime Minister Zapatero very closely. But really, the key thing is going to be watching to see what happens in the bond markets and whether there's a risk that Spain actually might be priced out of the bond markets. Yeah, and those bond markets actually open around 15 minutes. So I want to get your take, Natasha, in terms of what this means for the bond market. Uh, you were talking during the break. This is one of the only politicians being voted in because he's going to implement austerity measures. But now it seems actually austerity measures may be almost counterproductive if we're facing a recession. Well, I think you can, you can always argue from both sides, depending on what, what you want to do. In theory, it should be good. It's a conservative um, prime minister who has promised austerity measures, who has promised reforms, which is sort of the main thing really you need for the Spanish labor market. You need more flexibility there. You need to get rid of weight. Well, they have already done, made progress in terms of weight indexation, but that is still a problem in some areas. I think these are all, all issues. Uh, you know, if you compare it to Ireland, for example, they had a bailout, but bond yields have come down because the economy is much more flexible. And I think markets believe Ireland can make it, you know, and I think Spain has to get there as well. Well, I mean, one of the things that we've been focusing on is the fact that Rajoy hasn't actually outlined exactly how he's going to achieve a lot of the challenges. Mm. And I'm just wondering, you know, whether you think that there's a risk that, uh, that he won't go as far as markets actually expect him to. It does seem as if markets are really counting in a lot of austerity and a lot of reform. Yeah. I'm just wondering how successfully we'll be able to push that through. Well, I think it is quite promising that, that he has, it, he seems to have a very broad majority. I think that was one of the key issues in, in Greece uh, and in Italy, that the political um, situation was so fragile that you really needed the unity government to bring everyone together. The positive side is he has a broad majority in Parliament. He seems to have um, broad support in, in the country, even with the austerity measures. And I think that is a very good, good basis to really tackle even controversial reforms. Um, how concerned are you? You know, we talk about you know democracies actually going at a pace, and of course these markets latching on to and hoping much more, more quickly than these democracies can go. We're talking about the ECB before. How concerned are you that actually markets will always be disappointed if they don't give democracies enough time to get their act together? Well, that that is what I was saying earlier. You know, the, the confidence crisis is now so deeply entrenched that it's very, very difficult to actually present a news that's going to be positive. Everyone's latching on the negative side. And even if someone states the obvious, like Spain is under risk or something, you, you get market reactions. And it is really difficult to get out of that. And I think for that, you don't just need positive action in Spain. You need really, um, as Europe as a whole, need to convince markets that they're really doing something. And I think the constant infighting, the constant rumors, the leaks of proposals, not proposals, it's really not helping in that matter. It, it doesn't help, but I, I do want to pick up on something that you were just mm. saying earlier, and that, that the ECB's options are limited and, and, and it shouldn't really be uh, seen as the lender of last resort. But if we do see that Spain is priced out of the market and, 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 and also Italy, the same thing happens, what are the alternatives? Well, I, I do think um, concentrating just on this is really taking too short a view, because what you're doing is um, the, the ECB as a lender of last resort would be a temporary measure you know you could you could temporarily fix something fine but what you're buying what what you give up in in you know on, on the other side is the the prohibition of, of of debt monetizing you know I mean everybody has built the eurozone on the German on the German model and was banking on the German stability but that was built on that you know so now you are starting to dismantle all those stability mm -hmm. Um, all those stability principles, basically, you know, and I think in the long run you would have a much weaker eurozone if you started to go down that route. And I think the, the long-term negative consequences of that outweigh the short-term positive ones.